Okay, everyone, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Feels like ages since we've done Paul A. Eh? We've been through a whole uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> we've slept quite a few times since then. So um, today we're concluding the book of Romans. Uh, so I was hoping to kind of get this done prior to Unleavened Bread, but it is what it is. Uh, it's just the way things kind of felt. Uh, today we're going to be covering an issue that's actually really pertinent to us today. Uh, it definitely does apply. It's just that in our modern day, it looks slightly different. Um, but that statement will make sense. Um, who remembers what we did last time <laughs> in Paul? No, it's fine. I was having to revisit my own notes. Um, just to kind of refresh myself for this slide. So we'll do a quick recap. I know it was probably what, like three weeks ago, maybe even four weeks ago. Um, but we covered that Elohim hasn't rejected Judah. We saw that there was partial blindness upon Israel. Um, and yet, despite Judah not, uh, as a majority, not accepting Messiah, Elohim hadn't rejected them. And that actually, it was still part of his plan of redemption. Like, none of it took, it, took him by surprise. Um, and Paul uses this language that while blindness is in, uh, over these people, that the rest of the nations can actually come in. Um, we saw that the olive tree is the house of Israel. And this is what we're grafted into. And when I say the house of Israel, I mean both kingdoms, Judah and Ephraim, all 12 tribes, which means that what is the faith, right? Yeshua was the root, not Judah. And this is a common misconception in the Hebrew roots messianic movement that Judah is the root. You know, you, you get this term Hebrew roots, Hebrew roots, and um, technically that statement is true, but then people automatically think Judah and actually Messiah is the root or in other places he is the vine and we are the branches plugged in, which means that both Judah and Ephraim are plugged into the root, which is Yeshua. Let's not be proud against the branches that were broken off. And we can say that's Judah, but we can actually also say that that was us. At one point, we were branches that were broken off. Um, and I would address this statement with the verse, remember you were a slave in Egypt. We were all slaves in Egypt, therefore do not boast against the other slaves that are still in Egypt or maybe whose blinders have not been taken off and actually we're going to deal with this today a bit more you know how are those that have been walking in this faith maybe a bit longer how are they supposed to act towards people that have not been walking in this faith faith as long Paul equated the nations to the offspring of Ephraim I don't know if people remembered that he Paul uses the phrase um um, he says, blindness has come in part over Israel until the fullness of the nations comes in. Quoting, you know, where I, uh, uh, Jacob crossed his hands and blessed Ephraim and gave him the firstborn blessing, though he was the younger. And this is what Paul is using to make his statement about the nations, which means he's speaking of the seed of Ephraim, which is, again, the house of Israel. Being subject to the institutions of man... We were told that we're to subject ourselves to the institutions of man up until the point they ask you to sin. We made that distinction very clear. Like, unless they're asking you to sin, and I've put here captivity, we are in captivity. We are still reeling from the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and 29. We're yet awaiting regathering, which means we're in captivity. Just... And I've said this a few times before, it just so happens our captivity in the West has been quite plush. Uh, that seems to be, the tide seems to be turning on that. But that means that, um, in fact, I'll get to that point in a second. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. And that goes beyond that, right? But we're under the institutions of man. And until they're asking us to sin, we're to be a good witness uh, no matter how awkward or frustrating that can be, believe me. 
You know, I, my wife was an accountant, so she knows all the rigmarole, uh, is, you know, the, the mess that is accountancy and tax and here, and you just think, ah, oh, thieving crooks is what you think, but you have to pay your taxes. And unfortunately, this is just the state we're in, and this is the society that we live in. Elohim raises and topples kings and empires, which means that your current politicians, like them or not, Elohim allowed them to be in place. This means that, let's go down a more conspiratorial view, the NWO, the New World Order, the World Economic Forum, Elohim's allowed them. He's allowed them to be raised and he will topple them, but he will topple them. Nowhere in scripture do you see this thing of fight the king unless you were specifically called out by Elohim, by like an, a messenger or by a vision, these types of things. Elohim raises and topples kings and empires. And we read that we're to serve the righteous masters as well as the crooked ones. Which, suffering unrighteously, finds favour with Elohim. Or finds grace. This is how you find grace with Elohim. Suffering unrighteously under crooked masters. Yet being righteous ourselves. And this is what is part of our witness. This is what actually sends a very clear message to the unbeliever outside because they will watch and go, those people do not deserve this. This is not right. What is it that they have that we do not? And finally, we looked at what uh, putting on Messiah meant and that putting on Messiah was not this ethereal, you know, say the magic words and imagine yourself. It wasn't any of that. It was actually equated to putting off the works of darkness. And the works of darkness are defined by the law, by the Torah. So, let us conclude the book of Romans and jump right in into Romans 14. Receive him who is weak in the belief, not criticizing his thoughts. Okay? Read this. When you see weak or strong in the belief, think mature, less mature. Those, so someone who is weak in the faith is someone who hasn't been in the faith long. Or, well, it's not even whether, the, it's to do with maturity. It's to do with insight. It's to do with wisdom. Receive him who is weak in the belief, not criticizing his thoughts. Who here has been guilty of someone new coming into, the, into say, a fellowship setting and they say something and you're like, well, you should know. Like, and you kind of get that arrogant pride kind of come up, Paul saying, no, 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 no. Receive them who are young in the faith, who are weak in the belief and do not criticize their thoughts. They have much to learn. One indeed believes to eat all food. But he who is weak eats only vegetables, okay? Now, just as a heads up, the, this passage that we're going to cover is what is commonly used to say that we can eat all foods, i.e. pork, shrimp, all these types of things. And it's also used to say that you can make the Sabbath any day that you want. And we're going to, let's unpack this. Is this what Paul is saying? First of all, we need to realize what would have a Hebrew thought food is? Okay, you have to really understand that. What is food Hebraically de defined? But just to make the point clear, notice what he's contrasting. One indeed to believe, believes to eat all food, but he who is young in the faith, weak in the faith, eats only vegetables. So what are those that are strong in the faith eating? flesh, meat. The issue is meat here, okay? We're going to see that the issue is meat, so let's keep going. He that eats, let him not despise he who does not eat, i.e. meat. And he that does not eat, let him not judge him who eats meat, for Elohim received him. So both have been received by Elohim. Who who are you that you judge that who are you that judges another's servant to his own master he stands or fall but he shall be made to stand for elohim is able to make him stand so the issue here is someone who's young in the belief maybe hasn't grown as much and there's this issue of eating meat or not eating meat that's the context 
Paul is not talking about being able to eat unclean foods as we're going to see. Because this issue comes up in Corinthians, okay? And we're going to read some sections in Corinthians. And as we progress through Romans 14, we're going to see very clearly that Paul's not talking about clean or unclean. There's already an understanding of what food is, as defined by scripture. So why would some eat meat and others not? Right? This is not whether you should be a vegetarian or a vegan or not. Okay? This is not what was going on back then. So, to know what Paul is talking about, we have to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, verse um, 15. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. So he's speaking to the, like, is he speaking to someone weak in the faith now? No. This is a point that someone weak in the faith may actually stumble at. So he's speaking to those who are wise, those that have grown a bit. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Messiah? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Messiah? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So we're all one in Messiah. Look at Yisrael after the flesh, like, so think in the shadow picture. Are not those who eat of the slaughterings or the sacrifices sharers in the altar, the slaughter place? Who ate of the sacrifices at the altar? The priests, okay? So this is, by the way, this is another reason that you know that when Paul uses the term Israel, it can mean Judah. Because northern kingdom was not in the... Did you see where I'm, where I'm getting at here? But notice the context. Paul's going to say, are not the priests who eat of the sacrifices, are they not sharing in the altar? Now, Yeshua says, what is it that makes the altar sanctified? It's Elohim. Do not swear on the altar. Do not swear on the, by the temple because it's Elohim's seat, right? Now... When would you bring an offering to the temple? For what purpose? For worship. Well, because not all offerings were sin offerings, were they? You had free will offerings. You had offerings to give at the Moedim, at various festivals. The context that Paul is talking about is worship. Because if you were going to the altar, if you were going to the tabernacle or the temple to bring an offering, it was an act of worship, okay? It was, an, it was also an act of drawing near to Elohim. It was an act of drawing near. So this is not speaking of what you have at, on the dinner table, okay? What then do I say is an idol of any value? Or that which is slaughtered to idols is of any value. Okay? No, it's not. But what the nations slaughter, they slaughter to demons and not to Elohim. And I do not wish you to become sharers with demons. Okay? So from this, you will say, well, you can't eat food sacrificed to idols. But let's remember what the context was. Worship. Okay? The context was going to the temple, the priest eating the sacrifice as commanded by Torah. Thus he becomes a sharer. There's this unity between the priest, between the offerer, between Elohim. And remember that Paul is saying that when we partake of Messiah, the bread of life, we, we all, we're all one. And he's saying, I do not wish you to become sharers with demons. You are not able to drink the cup of the master and the cup of demons. You are not able to partake of the table of the master and the table of demons. Now, who knows what the table of the master is? Let me phrase it this way. What was the table of Elohim? Think idiomatically. The altar. Do we not see throughout Torah and the prophets about the sacrifices being food? It was known as the table of Elohim. So when the sacrifices were being given and the priest would be eating, there was this idea that you were dining at the table of Elohim. 
And he's saying you can't dine at two tables. Now, when would you dine at the table of, the, of Elohim? In the context of worship, okay? This is why you get this in Acts chapter 15. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the nations who are returning, who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilement of idols, from whoring, from what is strangled, and from blood. This is what would happen at a pagan temple when you worshipped. You would have, well, the first thing you'd do, you would sleep with the temple prostitute. Okay? whether it was a woman or a man, depending on what God you followed. And then you would strangle an animal, you would take the blood, and you would drink it, and you would eat of the meat. And this, is this making sense? This is why the commandment in Acts chapter 15, because you can't partake of the table of Elohim and the table of demons. Numbers 25 this is the daughters of Moab incident. The, the Yisrael dwelt in Shittim, and the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Now, what was the command in, in Acts 15, right? Think of that. And they invited the people to the slaughterings of their mighty ones, the sacrifices of their mighty ones, and the people ate and bowed down to their mighty ones. So what, what you've got going on here, thus Yisrael was joined to Baal Peor. And the displeasure of Yahweh against Israel. Notice what's happening as part of this pagan worship ritual. You have whoring, sexual immorality. You have uh, sacrifices to the idols, which would have been animals. The people eating of it and bowing down to the idols. So you've got all the things going on here that are actually forbidden in Acts chapter 15. The defilement of idols from whoring, from what is strangled and from blood. Uh, are people seeing the parallels? So this is why Paul is saying you cannot eat of two tables. You, now, here, listen to this. You eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions because of conscience. Here's something that a lot of people don't realise, but... He's writing to the Corinthians. Who's, who's ruling in Corinth at the time? Rome. Is Rome a pagan nation? Do they have pagan gods? Yes. It was very common for Roman people to slaughter their animals, sacrifice it to a pagan god, but they wouldn't be able to consume all the meat, so they would sell it on the market. And this is now the conundrum. Do you see the conundrum? Do I eat of this meat because it's been sac there's a possibility that it might have been sacrificed to an idol without my knowledge? The majority of meats in Corinth would have been sacrificed to idols. But Paul is saying here, hang on a minute, you can't partake of the table of demons or the table of Elohim, but then the context of that is worship. Like happened in Numbers 25, the people actually slept with the women, had an orgy, they had a, you know, a, um, a banquet, they bowed down to the eye. It was all part of the pagan ceremony. But here he's saying you eat whatever is sold in the meat market. And again, what is food to a Hebrew? Okay, this is not like your shoulder of pork. Okay. Asking no questions because of conscience. So you just buy it. You just buy it. Why? For the earth belongs to Yah and all that fills it. Who, 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 what does create, who does creation belong to? It doesn't belong to Molech or to Zeus. This is why Paul says an idol has no value. But the earth belongs to, to Yah and all that fills it. It's all his. And if any of the unbelievers invite you and you wish to go... You eat whatever is set before you, asking no question on account of the conscience. So if you look, an unbeliever back then, think pagan, pagan worshipper. There weren't many atheists back then. Either you were of Elohim or you were worshipping some kind of God or God's plural. And Paul is saying here, because you understand that the earth belongs to Yah, when you go to an unbeliever's house to eat, 
you don't ask and you eat it anyway. The, again, this is not speaking of clean or unclean. This is about meat in the market. And if anyone says to you, this was slaughtered to idols, do not eat it because of the one pointing it out to you. Not because of you, because of them. And on account of conscience, for the earth belongs to Yah and all that fills it. Now, do I, now I say conscience, not your own, but that of the other. So it's like, even though the believer would have known that would have been sacrificed to an idol. Paul saying, eat of it, but if it gets pointed out to you, don't eat of it. Why? Because of them. Why? Why would he say that? You're encouraging them to think that it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols from a pagan mindset. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? Paul understood the earth belongs to you. Look, look. You have a slab of lamb, okay? Does some, ho does some little ritual over it physically defile it? Or are we now going to start entertaining witchcraft? Do, do you see, like, is there some magic hocus pocus? Has the meat changed? No, it's still lamb. It's still lamb. It belongs to Yah. He declared it to be clean. You can eat lamb, right? But if someone told you, Oh, let's go there. No, no, I'll save that point for later. But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for what I gave thanks? And this is where mod, uh, uh, broad brushstroke, but the majority of Christianity will say, well, as long as you give thanks over whatever cut of pork, it's fine. But again, the context is food sacrifice to idols. It's not, this, the idea of clean, unclean wasn't even a discussion. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the esteem of Elohim. And this is the other thing that people will say, well, I'm doing it to the glory of God. He's told you what is good, O oh man, right? He's defined it very clearly. But can we see that this is not an issue of clean, unclean? This is of meat and whether it's sacrificed to idols or not. Cause no stumbling. This is the issue either to the Yehudim or to the Greeks or to the assembly of Elohim. This is why he says, like in Paul's mind, it's like, well, everything belongs to Yah. Everything belongs to Yah. Now, here's the thing. He says you can't worship. You can't partake of the table of demons in worship. But if you're just buying it from the market, have you partaken of the worship? No. No. And no amount of incantations over it. Lamb is lamb, whether you speak over it or not. Beef is beef, whether you speak over it or not. As I also please in all matters, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many that they might be saved. So he's starting, you're starting to see Paul's mindset. Because look, Paul was very learned. But he understood that he was... There were those that were not at his level. And they may stumble. They may stumble. Let's keep going with this. 1 Corinthians 8. And concerning food offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. However, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So because you have a certain understanding, it can actually cause you to fall into pride. You know, Paul says that a thorn was given in his flesh to keep him humble because of the greatness of the revelation that he had. If anyone thinks that he knows somewhat, he does not yet know as he should know. So essentially, if, if you've got a lot of understanding and knowledge, but you're thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to, you've got a way to go. But if anyone loves Elohim, this one is known by him. So then, concerning the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is no matter at all in the world. And there is no other Elohim but one. There's only one true God. All these things are false. Okay? 
For even if they are so-called mighty ones, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many mighty ones and many masters, for us there is one Elohim, the Father, from whom all came and for whom we live, and one Master Yeshua Messiah, through whom all came and through whom we live. Okay? So everything came from Elohim. Everything. Nothing can change that. Who knows who Paul's teacher was? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. So th- I want to kind of show something because Paul's thinking was actually, who understands that there were two schools of Judaism back then? There was the school of Shammai, the school of uh, Hillel, generally. And one was very letter or to the law orient- orientated and one was a bit more spirit behind the law, if that makes sense. And Paul was from the latter Now, I'm going to quote something from the Mishnah, not because I condone it, okay? Hear me out. I'm quoting this, not because I condone it, but to show the mindset of the Jews of the day. Is that clear? Okay? The reason I'm quoting this section is because this is a section that's actually attributed to Gamliel, Paul's teacher, okay? And there's a really interesting little story in here. A wise Gentile, Proclus ben Plospus, once asked a question of Rabban Gamliel in the city of Akko when he was bathing in the bathhouse of the Greek god Aphrodite. So a bathhouse, everyone went in there naked, there were toilets there, and there happens to be a a statue of Aphrodite there, which by the way is, um, it's the uh, goddess or, or the god of sex. And all these things. Proclus said to him, It is written in your Torah, and nothing of the prescribed items shall cleave to your hand. The quote there is Deuteronomy 13 8. It's speaking about uh, of, uh, items under the ban. If it says, If there's an item that's under the ban, you're, you're to get rid of it. You don't cling on to it. For what reason do you bathe before an idol in the bathhouse of Aphrodite? Rabban Gamliel said to him, one may not answer question related to Torah in the bathhouse. So you see a little tradition of theirs there. And when he left the bathhouse, Rabban Gamliel gave him several answers. He said to him, I did not come into its domain, speaking of the statue of Aphrodite, it came into my domain. The bathhouse existed before the statue dedicated to Aphrodite was erected. It's not a place of worship, is what he's saying. It's a bathhouse. The fact that there's a statue there, whatever. Furthermore, people do not say, let us make a bathhouse as an adornment for Aphrodite. Rather, they say, let us make a statue of Aphrodite as an adornment for the bathhouse. Therefore, the main structure is not the Aphrodite statue, but the bathhouse. Again, it's a bathhouse. It's not a temple. I'm going there to have a bath to go to the toilet. Rabban Gamliel continued, alternatively, there is another answer. Even if, you're, even if people would give you a lot of money, you would not enter before your object of idol worship naked. So he's now saying, uh, if you were to go bow down in worship to an idol within a temple context, this is what he's saying. Even if someone gave you loads of money, You would not enter before your object of idol worship naked. Or as one who experienced the seminal emission, who comes into the bathhouse to purify himself, nor would you urinate before it. So he's actually having a backhanding comment there. Because he's in a bathhouse, and part of what would happen at a bathhouse, they would relieve themselves. And Gamliel is saying, you wouldn't do that in your temple, so why are these guys doing it now? Do you see what's going on? This statue stands upon the sewage pipe, and all the people urinate before it. There is no prohibition in this case, as it's stated in the verse, they're gods. So you're not allowed to cling to anything that's of the false gods. Which indicates that a statue that people treat as a deity is forbidden. But one that people do not treat with the respect that is due to a deity is permitted. So what Gamliel was essentially saying, this is not an idol, this is a statue. This is not an object of worship. In fact, people are relieving themselves in front of it to to make the point. 
He's saying this is not an, a, a, an object of worship. So this is why Gamaliel says, I'm quite all right having the bath in this bathhouse. Now, the reason I bring this up, because you can kind of see a similar mentality in Paul, where he's saying, eat whatever is put in front of you. But if it's pointed out that this is a sacrifice to an idol, don't eat it in case they think you're an idol worshipper and that you're somehow condoning it. Jeremiah 10, I don't know if people can see the background, but this is basically ancient Babylonian tree worship going on. on the, uh, it's really hard to find a tablet where you can actually see it clearly, but I don't know, this here is the tree and then you've got your Babylonians behind it. Jeremiah 10, thus said, yeah, I bring this up because people say, oh, they didn't worship trees. Yes, they did. Do not learn the way of the nations and do not be awed by the signs of the heavens for the nations are awed by them. He's like, don't give it more credit than it's due. For the laws of these people are worthless. For one cuts a tree from the forest for work for the hands of the craftsman with a cutting tool. They beautify it with silver and gold. They strengthen it with nails and hammers so that it does not topple. They are rounded like a post and they do not speak. They have to be carried because they do not walk. Do not be afraid of them for they do no evil nor is it in them to do any good. He's saying don't be afraid of these things. This is why when I see a Christmas tree I do not freak out because it's worthless. It belongs to Elohim anyway. I'm not like, oh my goodness, there's some kind of evil dark powers coming from there. It's just a tree. But if you're going to make it an object of worship, ah, now we've got an issue. Look, in this building here, we, don't, we rent it from Salvation Army, a Christian denomination. Do we freak out when we see the Christmas tree? Some people have. Why? As Paul would say, they're young in the faith. There is none like you, O Yah. You are great, and great is your name in might. And this is, so you see this, this is the way Gamliel was thinking. Well, it's just a statue. People aren't worshipping in front of it. They're defecating in front of it. I'm not going to be afraid of that. But would, now, ask yourself, would he have gone into the temple of Aphrodite? No. Big difference. Big difference. So going back to this, for us there is one Elohim, there is one, there is only one true Elohim and he created everything and everything belongs to him. However, not all have this knowledge, but some being aware of the idol until now eat it as having been offered to an idol. So their conscience being weak is defiled. He's actually going to the heart of the matter now. Someone coming in and going, basically this person that's weak in the faith is thinking that they're partaking of the idol worship by eating this meat at the market. And Paul is saying, they'll give them some slack, they'll get there. What Paul is saying, you can't partake of the worship service, but... The meat belongs to Yah. He created it. He declared what is food, whether someone said something over it or not. But someone young in the faith may think, oh no, I'm worshipping idols. Notice, remember what Paul said when he says, you can't partake of the table of demons and the table of Elohim. The context was the sacrificial system. It wasn't having a dinner. He was specifically pointing of worship within a temple context. And, what, and again, remember the, the command in Acts chapter 15. Do not do these four things. Why? Because it's part of idol worship. But food does not commend us to Elohim. For we are none the better if we eat or none the worse for not eating. He's saying it's not about the food. The problem is whether your, your, your brother in the faith is stumbling. That's the issue. You don't want the weaker in the faith having their conscience defiled. 
But look to it, lest somehow this right of yours, i.e. being able to eat food from the market without asking questions, and even knowing that it might have been sacrificed to an idol, but knowing, I didn't partake of it, the earth belongs to you. Lamb is lamb, whatever incantation was put over it, beef is beef. But someone new to the faith may not see it that way. They may think, oh my goodness, you're partaking of idol worship. And he says, lest somehow this right of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. Now comes the warning to those that have been doing this for a while longer. Do not make your brother stumble. Just because you know something that they don't, allow them the room to grow and watch your step around them. Look, let's, make the, let's modernize this. Halal meat. Let's go there. Halal meat. Is Allah the God of gods? No. And no matter what one Muslim says over that beef or over whatever, it doesn't change the actual thing. Now, am I partaking of the blessing to Allah or whatever? No, and nor would I, because then I am partaking of the table of demons. But a chicken's chicken. Lamb is lamb. Beef is beef. Now, some people may have had a knee-jerk reaction when I said that. It's okay. It's okay. But this is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is saying. For anyone... For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, i.e. the knowledge that the, word, that the earth is Elohim's, eating in an idol's place, shall not his conscience, if he is weak, be built up to eat food offered to idols? This is the issue that Paul is talking about. Just because you realize that meat is meat, and you've not partaken of the worship of it, of the idol, so to speak, He's saying your brother may actually be encouraged to start partaking of idol worship. Now you become a stumbling block. And this is one of the things I see. People in this faith that understand some of the weightier matters and then new people come in and they either look down on them or they cause them to stumble. And this idea that they've got a bit of knowledge, it becomes, uh, it becomes pride to them. And I see it, and it's ugly. It's so ugly. Making the little one stumble because of knowledge. Using the truth of Elohim and actually defiling it, profaning it, by causing a brother to stumble. This is why Paul says, remember, he's Elohim's servant too. We're all servants in the house. So this weak brother for whom Messiah died shall perish through your knowledge. That blood is then on your hands. So let's, use, let's, use the, let's make the modern example again. Hello, me. I, I know there's people in this fellowship that don't mind. There may be some that do. Don't make each other stumble. Don't make each other stumble. Because if not, we can actually defile people's consciences. Now sinning, it's a, Paul's saying it's a sin. In this way against the brothers uh, and wounding their weak conscience, you actually sin against Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I am never going to eat meat. Again, this is not a clean, unclean argument. This is about food or meat on the markets that could have possibly been offered to an idol. Lest I make my brother stumble. Paul said it's better to go without for the sake of my brother. But some people will take it as a right. Well, it, it, never mind them. I have this right. Does he not know? 1 Corinthians 9.18, what then is my reward that in bringing the good news I should offer the good news of Messiah without cost so as to not abuse my authority in the good news? Like, look, Paul had some weighty authority, okay? He, he had visions of the third heaven. 
And he's saying, I'm not going to abuse my authority, my knowledge, the greatness of the revelation that he had, if it makes a brother stumble in something as simple as food. And I've seen people get, well, it's simple. It doesn't even really matter. Really? Paul's saying otherwise. You're sinning against your brother, thus sinning against Messiah. And again, I see this a lot in, in this Messianic Hebrew Roots movement. For though I am free from all, I made myself a servant to all. Again, the free, think of the freedom found in Messiah. And he's saying, though I'm free, I serve all in order to win more. And to the Yehudim, I became as a Yehudi, that I might win Yehudim. To those who are under Torah, as under Torah, so as to win those who are under Torah. This is the passage now that people will say that Paul was all things to all men, and basically he acted deceptively. So he would act like a pagan to the pagans. He would act like a Jew to the Jews. And, and it's like, is this what Paul is saying? To those without Torah, as without Torah, but then listen what he says. Not being without Torah toward Elohim, but under the Torah of Messiah. So he, to those he goes that are without Torah, he's still under Torah toward Elohim, but the Torah of Messiah. So essentially Paul is not saying that he, he breaks the law when he's with lawbreakers. So as to win those who were without Torah. To the weak I became as weak so as to win the weak. Now this statement will explain the previous statement about being without law. The weak of faith. Let's use the food offered to idols. Did Paul just completely stop eating meat? No, he only stopped eating meat around those that were weak. So he became weak towards the weak. So someone that's going to stumble over food, I'm not going to eat that meat in front of them. This is what Paul is talking about. To all men I have become all, so as to save some by all means. And I do this because of the good news, so as to become a fellow partaker with it. Again, he's trying to not abuse his authority and the knowledge that he has. Now, to really understand what Paul is saying in regards to becoming all things to all men, we have an absolute corker of an example in um, Acts chapter 17 where you see him being all things to all men, but without compromising the faith that he actually holds to. But while Shaul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred up within him when he saw that the city was utterly idolatrous. Therefore, indeed, he was reasoning in the congregation with the Yehudim and with the worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who met there. And having stood in the midst of the Areopagus, Shaul said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every matter. Notice he doesn't call them outright pagans. He says, you're very religious. For passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found a, a slaughter place or an altar with this inscription to the unknown mighty one. And this is what you see on the background. They found quite a few of these in various cities. Not knowing then whom you worship, I make him known to you. Look at what Paul's doing. He's taking something like, almost like, I see you have a very small kernel of truth. Let me take that and make a point. Yah, who made the world and all that is in it, this one being master of heaven and earth, does not dwell in dwellings made with hands. Nor is he served with men's hands as if needing any, himself giving to all life and breath and all else. And he has made from one blood every nation of men who dwell on all the face of the earth, having ordained beforehand the times and the boundaries of their dwellings, to seek the master if at least, oh sorry, if at least they would reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and are, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul's quoting pagan literature here to make the point. 
And in fact, let's go there. They reckon they found the original quote. It's in, like, it's in one of these great orators like Homer and all these types of things. It's speaking of, uh, what was their head god? I've forgotten now. Not Zeus, the Greek equivalent. Apollo, all these kind of gods. It might have been Apollo. He's using pagan literature. They had this saying that the, the, the Romans and the Greeks understood they were offsprings of gods. That's how they viewed it. And what Paul is saying, he's taking a kernel of truth and actually giving them the real truth with it. Is that making sense? He's not condoning their literature. He's just made, look, I've used the matrix to make a point here. I've quoted movies. Am I now condoning the movie? No, I'm using it to make a point. And this is what Paul was doing. He was becoming all things to all men. But notice where all the glory went, to Elohim. Now then, since we are the offspring of Elohim, he's essentially saying, look, you understand that you're the offspring of Elohim, but you've got the wrong Elohim and you don't know the real Elohim. We should not think that the Elohim is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by the skill and thought of man. Truly then, having overlooked these times of ignorance, Elohim now commands all men everywhere to repent. <laughs> Because he has set a day on which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, having given proof of this to all by raising him from the dead. So this, this is a perfect example of Paul becoming all things to all men. Notice he did not compromise the faith. So when he says, I become as a Jew, I become as, an, um, like, as a Gentile, he's not foregoing the, he's not compromising faith. He's just making himself, he's meeting them at where they're at. So, back to Romans 14, now that we've gone like on a huge detour. Receive him who is weak in the faith, in the belief, who's not mature enough yet. Not criticizing his thoughts, don't criticize his youth in faith. One indeed believes to eat all food, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now that statement should make a lot more sense. It's talking about meat in the markets. Now this was, look, he's writing to the Romans there. We've just been reading Corinthians, which was occupied by Rome. <laughs> Do you see the point? That there were deep, the Romans and the Corinthians were obviously dealing with the same issue. Because there were those that were strong in the faith and there were those that were weak in the faith in both assemblies. He that eats, let him not despise him who does not eat. And he that does not eat, let him not judge him who eats, for Elohim received him. Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he shall stand or fall. It's not for you to cast judgment on him. But he shall be made to stand, for Elohim is able to make him stand. Is everyone clear with food sacrifice to idols? Mm -hmm. Cool. One indeed judges one day above another. Another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. Guys, we're doing Shabbat on Wednesday next week. But this is what is, this verse is used to say, well, it doesn't matter that it's Sunday. In fact, it can be any day. Christ is my Sabbath, right? You hear that? And then misquoting Hebrews. What's the context of Romans 14? Well, first of all, it's eating food. So the context is food, eating. One indeed judges. Yeah, let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. He who minds the day, minds it to Yah. And he who does not mind the day, to Yah he does not mind it. He who, now again, he who eats, eats to Yah, for he gives Elohim thanks. And he who does not eat, what is it to not eat? Is to fast. To Yah he does not eat and gives Elohim thanks. Ah, oh, Michael, it doesn't really say fasting there. You know, it's, it's, that's not what it's talking about. Okay, let's see this through. First of all, the context is about meat from the markets, not clean or unclean. The clean and unclean is not even a discussion. 
Minding the day is not speaking of the Shabbat, as a lot of people will say it is. The context is food, eating, not eating. Who here has heard of the Didachi? The Didachi, right. The Didachi, also known as the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations, so Didachi is a lot smaller, is a brief anonymous early Christian treatise written in Koine Greek. Okay. This document is dated to the late 1st century AD by most scholars and to the early 2nd century AD by some. So you're kind of talking 70 AD to about 130 AD, that period of time is when this is dated to. Let's, there's a really interesting section in chapter 8, okay? Let not your fasts be with the hypocrites. They mean the Jews by that, by the way. This is a Christian document. For they fast on Mondays and Thursdays, but you, you should fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. There was actually an argument, don't fast on the same days as the Jews lest you look like a Jew. Remember that Christianity, was, by this stage, it was, it was polarizing from, um, from any Hebraic roots. And you had Judah on one side, Christianity on the other, and then this group of people left in the middle, which we'll cover next week. But notice here, don't fast like they do. And do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, pray thus. And then you get the Lord's prayer stated there. Pray thus three times a day. Is this Torah or is this dogma? It's dogma, it's tradition. It's the commands and precepts of men. Okay? But now that you understand that there was this argument going on in the first century, when Paul says, he who minds the day, he minds it to Yah, he who does not mind the day, to Yah he does not mind it. He who eats, eats to Yah. He who does not eat, to Yah he does not eat. It's talking about what days of fasting. And he's saying, one indeed judges one day above another, another judges every day alike. Like, look, the Sabbath is not like every day. It's set apart, it's called out from the other six days. And you had people going, well, this is the day of fasting. This is the special day. This has got nothing to do with the Sabbath. Galatians 4.9. Now, after you have known Elohim, or rather are known by Elohim, how do you turn again to the weak and poor elementary matters to which you wish to be enslaved again? You closely observe days and months and seasons and years. Now, people will say that this was just about the Moedim. They're clearly doing other fasts and other things here, closely observing them. I fear for you, lest by any means I have labored for you in vain. Brothers, I beg you to become as I am, because as I am as you are, you did no wrong. How was Paul? Did Paul lap the traditions up or did he say, get rid of them? <laughs> he said, get rid of them. Do not judge each other, uh, each other over tradition. The letter to the Galatians was to remind them to put their faith and hope in Messiah, not in the flesh, their acts, their deeds, right? This would have included the traditions of men as well as how to keep the Torah. And remember when we did the Galatians part of this series, the Miksat Ma'aseh Torah, the works of the law. This was a document, how to apply Torah in your life. And tradition, the precepts of men had worked their way into it. Go read it. Like there's, there's clear additions to Torah commands as part of this. Now, fasting, is there any... How many days are commanded to fast and to afflict ourselves in Torah? Just one a year. The rest of it... Again, he who minds the day, minds it to Yah. He who doesn't, doesn't, right? This, we'll circle back to this, but let's remind ourselves how Messiah freed us from dogma. And Paul literally says it, point blank. Colossians 2.13, you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, 
having forgiven you all trespasses, having blotted out that which was written by hand against us by the dogmas which stood against us. So he's saying that this, whatever stood against us was dogma. And Yeshua has taken that out. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the stake or to the cross. It's not the Torah that's been nailed to the cross. It's what was written against us by dogma. And this statement will make more sense when we look at the next passage. Having stripped the principalities and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having prevailed over them in it. Therefore, let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking. Notice the context, traditions, or in respect of a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come. He's saying the new moons, the Sabbaths, the festivals are a shadow of what's to come, but the body of Messiah. Paul is literally saying, hang on, let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking in respect to a festival or new moon or Sabbath, but the body of Messiah. They are to judge in those matters. You don't go to a pagan to be told what to do on new moons and, and feasts. We are to, Paul clearly, in fact, should any of you holding a matter against another go to be judged before the unrighteous and not before the set apart ones? Do you not know that the set apart ones shall judge the cosmos, the creation is what it says there. And if the world is judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we will judge messengers, angels, how much more the matters of this life? So we are to judge or to, um, to uh, diacrino would be the word, but things to do with this life. Paul's saying, guys, like the creation will be judged by the saints and you can't even like work things out now. So when he says, Christianity will say that Colossians 2 is about, you know, oh, don't tell me to keep the Sabbath. Don't tell me to keep the new moon. And actually Paul's saying, no, it's the body that's to judge you in regard to that. And he even says that they're a shadow of what is to come. Now, I don't know about you, but what's to come is really important, right? Is the whole point of our faith. Uh, I want to know as much about the way to matter by keeping that shadow picture. Because that's what the shadow picture does. It teaches us about the way to matter. Who here has found that no matter how many cycles through the feast, year in, year out, you learn something new? Go figure. That's why the shadow is important. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who has made both one, having broken down the partition of the barrier having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commands in dogma, so as to create in himself one renewed man from the two, thus making peace. We covered this earlier in the series, but there was a partition in the temple court that said, no Jew beyond this point. And Paul's saying that in Messiah, there's no partition between Jew, between foreigner, we're all one in Messiah. That uh, partition which was done by the precepts of men it's gone in Messiah now if those traditions are gone this is what Paul will say in a bit why are you judging each other over what days you're fasting when it's not even a Torah command and to completely restore to favor both of them unto Elohim in one body through the stake having destroyed the enmity by it and having come, he brought us good news, peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Because through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So again, we're all one, no matter what men say. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the set apart ones and members of the household of Elohim. So if Messiah freed us from all these dogmas, we're going to see what Paul is saying here. Like, 
moving forward? Like, why are you guys judging one another, passing sentence on one another over, over tradition? When in fact, he freed us from that. For not one of us lives to himself, and not one dies to himself. For, for both, if we live, we live unto the master. And if we die, we die unto the masters. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the masters. So you are not your own, is what he's saying. For unto this Messiah died and rose and lived again to rule over the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. He's saying that's where judgment occurs. Why are you judging your brother over what day he's fasting? For it has been written, as I live, says Yah, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to Elohim. Each one of us, therefore, shall give an account of himself to Elohim. So again, going back to the earlier point, just because you've, you understand a deeper insight to scripture and your brother is stumbling because he doesn't quite get it, and you rub it in his face, you will give an account to Messiah for your actions. Therefore, let us not judge one another any longer, but rather judge this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in our brother's way. So if your brother wants to fast on Thursday, let him have at it. If he wants to fast on Friday, let him have at it. And if he doesn't want to fast, let him have at it. I know and I'm persuaded in the Master Yeshua that none at all is common of itself. But he, to him who regards whatever to be common, to him it is common. So again, Paul realizes everything belongs to Elohim. Lamb is lamb, uh, beef is beef, trees are trees, all right? But to some people, it might be considered common and, I, and they don't want to partake of it. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not by your food ruin the one for whom Messiah died. So use food, you, whatever knowledge it is. Look, there's certain things that I purposely do not say to new people in the faith because I know it will make them stumble. It's too much for them to handle. But do I look down on them for it? No, but I'm not going to ruin that brother's faith either. I'm not going to cause him to stumble because it, it, can you see how Paul is actually saying that this is actually an issue of heart? Because if you believe you're truly, let's use halal me, if you truly believe that you're somehow worshipping Allah by eating something, to you that's sin because you believe it. Do not then allow your good to be spoken of as evil. For the reign of Elohim is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the set-apart spirit. For he who is serving Messiah in these matters is well-pleasing to Elohim and approved by men. So then let us pursue the matters of peace and the matters for building up one another. Your brother will get it in time. Allow him the space to grow. Which again is basically the whole point of Acts chapter 15. Let them grow. They'll work it out in time. As long as they stay in repentance, as long as they stay plugged in, they will grow. Do not destroy the work of Elohim for the sake of food or your higher knowledge, let's say. All indeed are clean. All is clean. Again, within the confines of scripture, okay? But evil to that man who eats so as to cause stumbling. Again, the context is meat in the market. It's not a clean or unclean discussion. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine, nor to do whatever by which your brother stumbles. Look, some people get a bit touchy with alcohol. You shouldn't drink. And Paul's saying, look, it's good not to drink wine. But like, where's the command, do not drink wine? There is the command, do not be a drunkard. Your Messiah drunk wine. Again, like, there's loads of these issues throughout the body. Halal meat, uh, food offered to idols, whether to be vegetarian or not, hopefully that settles it today. But 
Do you see what I mean? Things that are not really spelled out in Torah and people arguing over it. Do you have belief? Have it to yourself before Elohim. Blessed is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. This does not give you a, a, a free pass to call everything approved. This is with it, again, the context is meat in the markets. Let's not pull it out of context. But if you have faith, have it. do not go around bashing your brother with it. Do not cause your brother to stumble. And I, again, I've seen this happen. But he who doubts, if he eats, he is condemned. Because it is not of belief. And all that is not of belief is sin. It's, so this is where it gets really interesting. Paul got it to such a level that... Here's the irony, a brother, someone let's say he genuinely believed that by eating halal meat or food offered to idols, genuinely believed he was worshipping a foreign god by doing so. Technically, in the technical written word, he's not, because he's not partaken of the actual worship ceremony, but his heart, his mind is defiled. This kind of exposes how the Torah is a shadow. It's useful. It's elementary, as Paul would say. It's the foundation. It's immovable. It's unchangeable. But there's something behind it. The heart matter. The, the spiritual matter. And this is what Paul was getting at. See, this is where someone could say, Oh, well, you're not sinning. Just eat the bloody thing. Eat it. Eat it. You're not sinning, but they, in their mind, in their heart, they are. This is why some... Oh, I won't go there. Stumbling blocks. Matthew 18, 6. Whoever causes one of these little ones to, in, who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned into the depths of your, in the sea. That's your king saying that. Not very politically correct. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks, for it is necessary that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to that man by whom the stumbling block comes. And Paul is saying these can even be the really knowledgeable ones, those that have been walking this out quite some time. Better for them to be thrown into the sea. By the way, I've just realised, but there's a huge parallel there to Pharaoh's army. If you're being a stumbling block to your brother, you, you may as well go in with Pharaoh's army. Matthew 13, 40. As the Darnell, the tares, then are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this age. The son of Adam, the son of man, shall send out his messengers, and they shall gather out of his reign. So when's his reign occurring? It's the thousand year reign. So this is actually at the end of the thousand years. They shall gather out of his reign, out of his kingdom, all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness and shall throw them into the furnace of fire. They shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, that's your king speaking. This is why, you know, I've got all the time for someone who's struggling in their faith, but someone who's being a stumbling block to other people, that's not on. And Messiah would agree with that. Romans 15, let's start wrapping up. But we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Again, the context is making your brother stumble in things of knowledge and he's using food sacrifice to idols in this thing. Those of us that know a thing or two more, we need to bear with the failings of those who are still learning. Not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbour for his good, to build him up. For even as Messiah did not please himself, but as it has been written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell upon me. For whatever was written before was written for our instruction that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have the expectation by the way and when Paul is saying the encouragement of the scriptures he's only got the Tanakh at this point 
the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And the Elohim of endurance and encouragement give you to be of the same mind towards one another, according to Messiah Yeshua, that with one mind and one mouth you might praise the Elohim and Father of our Master Yeshua Messiah. Here's the thing, if we're causing our brothers and sisters to stumble, we're not of one mind. So accept one another, warts and all, right? Strong or weak. As Messiah also did accept us to the esteem of Elohim. So, <laughs> we've concluded Romans. I hope people understand this whole thing of food offered. Like, look, to summarize, if you're not partaking of the worship part, food's food, as defined by Leviticus, right? Food, not things that are not considered food. Hopefully we can see that it's, some, it's not so much, there is the written Torah, but there is also that thing of the heart. And he's exposing that you can actually, things that are not of faith, a sin. What might be sinful to someone may not actually be sinful to the other. But that's all because of whether you're, you're grow, you've, the level of maturity you have in the faith. Anyway, let's stop here and have a break. Amen. <laughs>